starts right now. New cases of COVID coming to light in Bear County even after death. The new discoveries made through the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. And we're also learning of a COVID party where infection is intentional. These new developments coming as Bear County sees more than 900 new cases of COVID-19. Our new total tonight sits at 17,679. More than 6,000 people have recovered, but more than 11,000 remain ill. We have a total of 165 deaths, six of them reported today. 13 other deaths confirmed to be related to COVID-19 weeks after the fact. The 13 deaths came from the Metro Health Postmortem Surveillance Program. The mayor says San Antonio, one of the few cities in the country that actually has this program. Metro Health and the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office working together to identify people who might have been battling COVID-19 prior to dying. If a person passes away and has a reported and has a reported history of signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but lacks documentation of a test being done, the medical examiner in partnership with Metro Health tests them post-mortem and reports findings to Metro Health. The, those 13 deaths happened over the last three weeks. Metro Health says most of them most likely died at home. And now the hope is to keep the coronavirus from spreading even further. And there is a new Southside hotspot tonight. The Windsor Mission Oaks Nursing Home has dozens of residents testing positive for the illness. The facility is on Roosevelt, just south of East South Cross. And I team Stephen Cavazos is there live. Stephen, we've reported on the strict lockdowns at nursing type facilities before. Do we know how this outbreak happened? We'll see right now the outbreak or that answer is still unclear at this time of how this outbreak began, but Metro Health says they were first alerted when a staff member tested positive. Metro Health estimates that there are about 100 residents at the facility and they estimate that well now more than half that is have tested positive. We received a report yesterday of 66 positive residents. And Dr. Junda Wu, medical director at Metro Health, says the majority are without symptoms. Those residents at Windsor Mission Oaks on the city's south side have been separated into another part of the building. Metro Health says they've been working with the facility to help with testing and notify them to follow CDC guidelines. That includes retesting residents who had a negative result. And keep on retesting every week until you don't find any new positives. Dr. Wu says that's a way to help stop transmission. The nursing home helps take care of behavioral health patients. Regency Healthcare, which oversees a facility, released this statement, which says in part, quote, staff members at all our facilities continue to follow enhanced infection control and prevention processes that were implemented when the pandemic began in early March, end quote. It's not clear how the virus spread in the facility, but Dr. Wu says it can be easily transmitted if the proper precautions aren't being taken. A lot of nursing homes have reported staffers and, and usually that's community transmission. If they're not being meticulous, donning and doffing their PPE between every room, that can cause transmissions. Dr. Wu says it would be a challenge to move infected residents, especially with it being such a large group. Especially behavioral health patients, they don't relish just being picked up and moved someplace else. Now, Regency Healthcare, which again oversees the facility, tells us that the staff members that tested positive were sent home and will not return to work until they are given the clear. Now, they, the company did not specify the exact number of staff members. However, this outbreak comes more than almost three months after the massive outbreak at the Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. Reporting live on the city's south side, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Steve Isis. Thank you, Stephen. Our hospitals are remaining at 11% capacity for the third night in a row. And while it is steady, the low number of beds is still concerning. Here's a look at the hospitalizations. Tonight, 1,216 people are in the hospital. 399 are in the ICU and 231 are on ventilators. It's been described as a disturbing contest, COVID parties. Young people attend a party to see who gets infected first or who can survive the virus. It's been reported in Alabama, and now a San Antonio doctor says a young man died after attending a COVID-19 party. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with the case out of Methodist Hospital. One of the things that was heart-wrenching that he said to his nurse was, you know, um, I think I made a mistake. 
and this young man went to a COVID party. Chief Medical Officer for Methodist Hospital, Dr. Jane Appleby, says the man was just 30 years old. He didn't really believe. He thought the disease was a hoax. He thought he was young and he was invincible and wouldn't get affected uh, by the disease. Appleby says lately she's been hearing about COVID-19 parties. Someone will be diagnosed with the disease and they'll have a party to invite their friends over to see if they can beat the disease. Appleby says some young patients don't realize how sick they really are. People will come in initially and they don't they don't look so bad. They don't look really sick. But when you check their oxygen levels and you check their lab tests, uh, they're really sicker than they appear on the surface. Appleby says if you are not feeling well, have a high fever, cough and severe muscle aches, you should get help. My plea uh, to our community and especially all of our young folks in the community is to take it seriously. Wear your mask. Dr. Ken Davis with Krista Santa Rosa also talked about young people and COVID-19 during tonight's briefing. He said young people are not only dying, but they're also experiencing long term effects like joint pain that could last for months. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And worries continue to mount for health care providers as the demand for COVID-19 tests remains high. This week, the city changed its rules at three te city testing facilities. Only people with symptoms are allowed to get tested. The 19th Stephen Cavazos spoke to one San Antonio doctor who explains why this could lead to more problems in the coming days. If we don't take control of the testing and the follow up, the outlook does not look good even by next week. Dr. Sully Jafar says he has mixed feelings about the new changes at city testing sites. This week, the city made the decision to no longer test people who aren't showing symptoms. Dr. Jafar believes health care providers should have been given the heads up sooner so they could prepare for another wave of people wanting to get tested, something he remains frustrated over. We do not have uh, some kind of leadership. Dr. Jafar, who works at Medcare Associates, says all four of his locations are averaging 20 tests per day, but he's expecting that number to go up, which could pose a challenge. Um, am I worried that a lot of people are not going to be able to be tested? Yes. But Metro Health officials say the recent surge of cases has led to new obstacles. It's a challenging uh, experience we're undergoing right now. Jennifer Harriet is a deputy director at Metro Health. She says their main focus is getting people with symptoms tested first. Harriet says of the people showing up to the testing sites, many have no other option. Many of them probably don't have primary care physicians and have a hard time accessing a place that they can test. But Dr. Jafar remains concerned what this could mean for local health care facilities. He says right now he has the resources to test, but he's unsure how long that will last. Well, it's going to be less testing um, and more transmission. Now, Dr. Jafar adds that he's been in contact with his patients. He says it's made a difference when it comes to keeping the numbers down at his facilities. However, he says he'd like to have more communication with Metro Health officials in an effort to establish better testing coordination. Reporting, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. And as all this is playing out, Metro Health has said the state is providing our area with free COVID antigen tests. Instead of the nasal swabs, these tests use mouth swabs and allow for the city's testing capacity to increase. Here's what Metro Health had to say when we asked about their reliability. They are very reliable. Um, they are um, particularly reliable when you are symptomatic. So um, that is one of the reasons that we wanted to encourage folks that were symptomatic to come to these um, locations because um, those those are the they're going to be most accurate when an individual is symptomatic. The COVID-19 testing continues at Freeman Coliseum, but you need to make an appointment by calling 311. When it comes to walk up testing sites, there are two that are open seven days a week through the end of July. They're at Kazen Middle School on Gillette Boulevard in Cuellar Community Center on San Fernando. The tests and those sites will be open from 10 in the morning until 2 p.m., but there is a limit of only 300 tests per day. A reminder, if you do have insurance, you're encouraged to get a test through your health care provider. All right now on KSAT.com, we've heard concerns over cats and the coronavirus, but Texas officials now say a dog in North Texas is now the first coronavirus infection confirmed in a Texas animal. A private veterinarian tested the pet as a precaution after its owners were confirmed to have COVID-19. State veterinarian Dr. Andy Schwartz says there is no known evidence that pets can transmit the virus, but they can catch it.
A night beat update tonight. A man missing since July 4th found dead after visiting Canyon Lake. Dive teams help recover the body, body of 25 year old Luis Rodriguez. Witnesses say he jumped off a boat to cool off and was in the water for just a few minutes before he went underwater. Days later, his body was found in the area of Party Cove at Canyon Lake. Along with Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Houston and Harris County Dive Team and the Canyon Lake Fire Department all helped in the effort. They're still ahead on the night beat as models try to predict the curve for coronavirus cases here in San Antonio. What can we expect? A live discussion with infectious disease Dr. Ruth Berger coming up in our KSAT Q&A. And with schools preparing to reopen, some parents might be considering homeschooling. Instead, a closer look into that option coming up. And the push for change has left one councilwoman with a goal for the east side of our city. Now she hopes to make it happen next on the Night Beat. Transcripts now released in the George Floyd case. They come from the arresting officers' body cameras, revealing what was said and done the moments before Floyd's death in Minneapolis. As ABC's Zareen Shah reports, one former officer has tried to have the charges dismissed. The evidence released after a lawyer for one of the former officers involved, Thomas Lane, filed a motion to have charges dismissed. Lane, along with two others, is charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. Former officer Derek Chauvin is charged with second degree murder in Floyd's death. Lane, who has pleaded not guilty, told investigators he was following Officer Chauvin's lead because he's the senior officer. It was he who was captured on camera digging his knee into Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes. His lawyer says Lane asked twice if they should roll Floyd to his side and express worry about his condition. He had no knowledge that Chauvin was causing or was committing an assault from where he was at and in his mind. Lane also says Floyd resisted getting into the police car, insisting he was claustrophobic. According to Chauvin's transcripts, he told Floyd, quote, stop yelling, it takes a heck of a lot of oxygen to talk. The transcripts revealing Floyd repeating he could not breathe at least 20 times, saying, I'm sorry, many times, including saying, Mr. Officer, please don't shoot me, man. Lane's lawyer said Lane tried helping with CPR once Floyd was in an ambulance. In this situation, with all of the facts and circumstances, there's no question that my client had no knowledge a crime was committed. The court filing also include these images of the alleged counterfeit $20 bill Floyd was accused of using. Lane's lawyer says he expects a ruling on the dismissal request as early as September. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Back here at home, the ongoing Black Lives Matter movement continues to highlight racial and economic disparities. District 2 City Councilwoman Jada Andrews Sullivan says she has a plan that may help bring change to the east side. She hopes to use funding to create initiatives that include job and skill training, door to door health care, education and testing. The plan includes a focus on self-sustaining businesses that hire people from the community and benefit the community. Even if it's um, producing the, the markets and the community markets and the community stores that we need. Sullivan also wants to make sure small business owners in the area are financially literate so they know how to access available funding. The idea will still need to go up for a vote by the city's tax increment reinvestment zone board before city council considers it as part of next year's budget. Well, many San Antonio, San Antonio parents are saying no thank you to having kids back in the classroom next fall. Some are even considering traditional homeschooling. The night team's Patty Santos tells us what some say you need to consider to have a successful experience. Homeschoolers. Homeschools technically are private schools and each family is their own school. Tim Lambert with the Texas Homeschool Coalition says their website and email has been flooded with parents asking how to get started. A lot of folks are asking uh, if I want to do this, do I, how do I withdraw my kids from the public school? Uh, what about uh, transcripts if I want to go to college? Online learning through a district and traditional homeschooling are not the same thing. The Texas Education Agency has information on its website with some resources to help. No one in the state keeps hard numbers on how many Texas kids are homeschooled, but the coalition estimates that there's over 350,000. We expect to see those numbers significantly increase. 
how much does homeschooling cost? You can spend as much money or as little money as you want to on homeschooling. Will I be teaching all day? Especially if your kids are younger, you can spend an hour or two hours with them and accomplish all that they, that they need to do that they would do in a classroom. And then you have free time. What about connecting with other kids? Lambert says when not in a pandemic, homeschool kids have group meetups. So it's possible to have those, those experiences online uh, that you would normally have where children would spend time together. He points to resources on their website to help parents pick a curriculum that fits them. And if it doesn't work, change it up. Anybody can do this if you have a heart to do it and you will find that you will learn as much as your children. He says first time homeschooling parents will need a lot of support, but there are online groups and mentoring programs available. You can find out more on KSAT.com. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. I want to take you with live cam. This is Sky 12. This is a fire that we have been watching since five o'clock. It first came out as a brush fire. This is near Highway 78 in Shirts. The Shirts Fire Department has said this fire is contained. But I don't know if you remember the mulch fire that was in the Holotus area many, many years ago. They kind of gave it the nickname Mulchy. Mm -hmm. This looks a lot like that. I don't know if this is mulch that's burning or exactly what is burning, but we did have somebody tell us this is a junkyard. But this fire continues to burn at this hour. And like I said, it's been over five hours since we first started watching it. But wow. they say it's contained. Yeah, and certainly the temperature is not helping anything. No, that and we do have a little bit of a breeze out there and sometimes windy conditions can make it hard to get those fires out. But yeah, at least looks like it's a little bit contained out there. Uh, we do have some dry earth developing across South Texas due to a lack of rainfall uh, recently. Also due to a lack of recent rainfall, the aquifer level continues to tumble fairly steadily. Today's level 658.1 is below that 660 threshold, but it's the 10 day average that we watch really closely here and it is below 660 feet today. The 10 day average is 659.8 because of that saws customers stage one watering restrictions go into effect tomorrow. Yes, this begins tomorrow. Do keep in mind we've had a few questions. Handheld watering is allowed any day at any time, uh, but otherwise the watering depends on your street address, what number it ends in, and the corresponding day of the week there for your street address. We've got a lot of information about this from meteorologist Justin Horn. That's on KSAT.com. You can find this image there. Save it so you can kind of reference it if you need to. And unfortunately, we do not have rain in the forecast, and it's because of our overall weather pattern. The steering flow in the upper levels of the atmosphere keeps the heat high very close to us. Even as we get into the middle part of next week, these upper level high pressure systems systems suppress air. They push it down to the ground that keeps any rain from being able to develop vertically and grow upward. And that compression of the air also makes things just a bit hotter than normal. And that's why we've got triple digits all the way across the planning forecast and unfortunately no chance of rain. I'm taking this rainfall product seven days out a whole week and it's not just us here in South Texas, but across a good portion of the Lone Star State under the influence of that heat high, just no rain able to get going. So unfortunately things are going to be staying dry for us here in South Texas. Today's high temperature 99 degrees after a morning low of just 80 humid and warm out there to start and then uh, very hot this afternoon and it's still feeling a little bit hot out there tonight. Our air temperature in San Antonio is 87. When you factor in the dew point, it feels more like 94 out in Del Rio. Your air temperature is 97 feeling like 100 degrees and we still do have a few spots off to the southwest in the low 90s tonight. Take a look at these dew points. They dropped a little bit this afternoon, but not a whole lot and that's why we had some high heat index values during the heat of the day. They were getting close to 110 degrees this afternoon and we could see a repeat of that tomorrow. But again, kind of our saving grace tonight while it's warm, while it's sticky out there. We do have a nice breeze in place out of the south southeast right now. Our sustained wind in San Antonio closer to 20 miles per hour. So that breeze is at least keeping things moving around just a little bit tonight. We're also looking at low temperatures only in the upper 70s near 80 degrees. It'll become partly cloudy overnight, mostly cloudy as we get closer to dawn tomorrow. But just like what we saw today, 
After a little cloud cover in the morning, we'll see mostly sunny skies in the afternoon. That puts our air temperatures back near 101. Heat index anywhere from about 105 to 110. That is certainly not out of the question tomorrow afternoon. And here are your heat index readings tomorrow. So these are not the actual air temperatures. This is what it will feel like when you factor in the dew point. We could have some numbers close to 110 down on the coastal bend, even down to the southwest and out in Valverde County toward Del Rio. So another hot day tomorrow. If your job keeps you outside for prolonged periods of time, please just make sure you take breaks when you can and stay hydrated as well. As far as any record breaking heat, we'll make a run at that late this weekend into early next week. And unfortunately, nothing but triple digits for the foreseeable future. We did have our newest tropical storm develop this afternoon. We'll talk more about that coming up next half hour. And with yes. that hot, take care of each other. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. All right. So what do you take on a business trip to a bubble? <laughs> Larry, the Spurs are finding that out. Yes, and that was a very popular question leading up to it. Some of the Spurs were taking their X Games and certain pairs of clothes or whatever. Well, Patty Mills definitely taking some necessities. Topo Chico, how awesome is that? Yeah, plus the Big Ten made a major, and I mean major move today coming up. And there they go. The Spurs left San Antonio around 2.30 this afternoon for Orlando, one of 22 NBA teams to help restart the season. The Spurs' first team trip in four months before play was suspended due to COVID-19. And here's some pictures they posted today. Lonnie Walker IV rocking a face mask, Red Adidas flip-flops, and carrying a book. Rudy Gay and Derek White, Gay traveling with an L.A. Dodgers cap and Yukon hoodie. But here's my favorite, Patty Mills with guitar in one hand and a case of Topo Chico in the other. The Topo was a big hit on social media. Now the Spurs were four games out of eighth in the West when play was stopped. DeMar is happy they made the 22 team cut, but certainly wishes they could have finished out the regular season in normal fashion. Just basketball coming back is a second chance for, for everybody. You know, um, it sucks that we couldn't play out, you know, the last 20, 20 games, 21 games, however many games we had left to be able to really give ourselves a chance when I felt like we, 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 we was getting on a roll toward the um, end of the season to give us give us a real true fair chance to make the playoffs. You know, this format, you know, it's kind of a tricky situation because, you know, you got to hope for other things to go wrong and you damn near got to go out there and be perfect. Check out the water view from Marco Bellinelli's room overlooking Crescent Lake at the Yacht Club where the Spurs are staying. A sweet view while he's isolated for the next 36 to 48 hours. And the Orlando Magic hit the court today, becoming the first team to practice during the NBA restart at Disney. They got up and down the floor but avoided any contact drills or five-on-five -five work during the workout at the Coronado Hotel Ballroom. The Big Ten is the first Power Five conference to change schedule due to the COVID-19 pandemic, announcing today it will not play non-conference games in football and several other sports this fall because of the coronavirus. The league cited medical advice in making its decision and added that the plan would be applied only if the conference is able to participate in fall sports. Here's what Ohio State AD Gene Smith told the media during a conference call after the news was announced. I am very concerned. I think in our last conversation, I was, you know, cautiously optimistic. You know, I'm not even there now. So I am concerned that we may not be able to play, uh, which is why we took the measure that we took in order to try and have September available to us for conference games and, and give us the flexibility and control to handle disruptions uh, if we're able to start a season. We uh, just didn't respond to our opportunities uh, that were provided to us. People need to, to follow the protocols and give our kids a chance to, to compete. There was no immediate reaction from the other big conferences, though the SEC, ACC, Big 12, and Pac-12 have all indicated they intend to play fall sports, anchored by football, by far the biggest moneymaker. Coming up next, Astros' Forrest Whitley is approaching every outing like it's Game 7 of the World Series. 
Houston Astros pitcher Forrest Whitley is trying to make the big club this season and says he's approaching every outing like it's Game 7 of the World Series. During his live batting practice session, he caught the eye of skipper Dusty Baker, who said that's the best he's ever seen Whitley and that he's impressed with him. Drafted 17th overall in 2016, Forrest knows all eyes are on him. It was a real honor to be up, be back out there on that mound. It's been since the exhibition game since I've been back out there. Um, but yeah, I felt great. Uh, everything was coming out really well. I was throwing things for strikes. I was throwing my slider for a strike, my curveball for a strike. Uh, my changeup was getting down when I needed it to. I pretty much checked off all the boxes uh, for my first live BP uh, since pretty much uh, spring training, actually. So I was really happy with how everything went and just kind of take that momentum into the next one. After spring training was canceled in March, Whitley lost 30 pounds and now weighs around 206 at six foot seven. He said he just likes this weight better. Meanwhile, up in Arlington, the Texas Rangers are going through the drills as they prepare for the shortened 60 game regular season. And this is a special campaign for them because of their brand new ballpark, $1.2 billion globe life field sitting right across the street from their old stadium. The guys are using this time to adjust to the new field, clubhouse, etc. The field itself is immaculate. I can't say enough about the field itself. Um, you know, the indoor 72, I, I honestly worry that we're going to have a little bit of a, a heat stroke when we get into 90 degree weather, you know, when we go to LA or something. It's funny to say that in Texas, but uh, it's the truth. I mean, it's my office is cold, the, the field is almost chilly. You know, then I walk outside and it's 100 degrees, so we don't have to deal with that, which is a beautiful thing. The Rangers are open the season at home July 24th with the Rockies and likely without fans, at least on the opening homestand. That's a good looking stadium. Though. It is. I can't wait to go there. Seems I can to see it finished. I've just seen it during the process of being built. Yeah. Some people have been critical about the way it looks outside, though. Yes, they have. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Larry. You got it. Hey, coming up, predicting the surge in coronavirus cases. We speak with infectious disease doctor Ruth Berger and live in our KSAT Q&A next. It's our KSAT Q&A where we separate the fact from the fiction around a lot of the different stories that are out there. And as we are most every Thursday, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergerin from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio to help clear up some of the questions that you have and some of the questions that we have. And first off, doctor, we, we saw we've been seeing the statistics over the last few weeks and the number of positive cases rising. It seems in the last few days we've also seen the number of deaths rising. What are you seeing in the data and what is your graph telling you about where we're headed right now? Uh, thanks for the question. It's an important one. Um, there's a beginning of a leveling off of the hospitalization rate. So our SG2 model looks at patients that are hospitalized over time. And uh, we have an updated model that's uh, showing us data, sort of a curve that starts on the 22nd of May and goes um, through the 1st of September. That, and, we're actually looking at that right now, doctor. Okay. I just want to let you know, we've got it on the screen right now for people. And the, the blue line that you can see with the dots is, is based on the actual numbers. And that orangish looking line that it's closely following is what the model is projecting. And that model takes into account a lot of things. It takes into account the population density of San Antonio, takes into account the dates at which we imposed restrictions and when we relaxed restrictions and then when we reimposed them again. It's taking into account things like the 4th of July and predicting that there will be additional cases and hospitalizations related to exposures to families and larger groups on the 4th of July. But what you can see is that we're getting very close to the projected peak. We're just a couple of days away from that and that the peak stays beneath the number 1400, which is encouraging to us in the hospital world because that was um, an estimate of our surge capacity. So it shows us not exceeding that, but getting right up to it. And what's problematic for me as I look at this curve is how long it stays on that plateau. So it went up high, it didn't go overwhelmingly high, but it's staying on this high plateau for quite a few weeks. And if you look closely, you see that it's not for another two to three weeks that we start to see a significant downturn. And we're still looking at fairly high levels of hospitalizations around mid-August when our when the children will be going back to school and uh, not coming completely down to a 
pre-surge level un until September. Then, of course, then, of course, we have a big wild card, which is what's going to happen in the fall and what's going to happen when all those kids are in school and the flu season begins. But uh, we need to remain situationally aware in San Antonio. And there's several lessons. You know, when we reimpose restrictions, particularly the important masking order that came from our governor, these kinds of things make a difference. And just because you start to see a leveling off doesn't mean you, you should then relax again, because if we relax again, the curve will go a lot higher than what this model predicts. Dr. Bergen, we are just a few short weeks away, as you mentioned, from the start of this next school year. And uh, there's a lot of anxiety, you know, especially for parents as kids head back to school or are prepared to head back to school. What considerations should parents be making when they're having those discussions in their household and whether or not to send their kids back? Right. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out in favor of kids going back to school. What I think families need to keep track of is data rather than dates. And if a particular community is starting to see a major uptick and a major surge, the hospitals are getting overwhelmed again, that might be a time to hold off or pull back. But if the hospitalization rate has been coming down for 14 days, if the hospitals are not overwhelmed, I think people should have a greater level of confidence. And then there's a lot of room for individual behaviors, classroom by classroom, school by school, to be addressed and mitigated to really reduce risk. And I think that I would encourage every parent to be highly engaged with their local school system, get very involved with the Parent Teacher Association, and talk about what's being done to reduce the number of people that the kids are exposed to in a day, to reduce the closeness and reduce the duration that they're closely exposed to others and to look at ways of modifying. And that means smaller classroom sizes, spacing desks apart, um, having classes outdoors if it's possible. If it's not too hot and there's a shady place, going outdoors would be a great idea. Having classes in large gymnasiums that have good air exchange where you can have people really spaced farther apart. These are all modifications that can be put in place. And then, of course, there's certain activities that should be avoided, such as wind instruments in a band or singing, because those are activities that cause aerosolization of the virus and can increase risk of transmission. So I would encourage parents to uh, get engaged with their schools, also talk to the kids and, and really get the kids involved in this and, and help the kids to influence one another to adopt the behaviors that can help keep them safe and also keep their teachers safe and keep the families and their grandmother and grandfather safe. All right, I pulled out one of our viewer questions. We've been getting a lot of questions about this particular video. Some people have been sending me the video. Uh, this, this is a question from Sandy. She said, I wondered if you could pass along to Dr. Ruth about the use of budesonide in a nebulizer to people when first diagnosed with COVID-19. I listened to an interview on YouTube about a doctor in West Texas who claims it's the cure. If it's the cure, why isn't it be, being done everywhere? Right. So this is a premature declaration of a cure and a medicine that is a known medicine that has important indications, but that's being adapted for use in a way that's completely unstudied. Now, it is in a class of drug called steroids. These are drugs that modulate our immune system and kind of tamp down the inflammatory response of our immune system. We do have some good clinical data from an oral steroid called dexamethasone. There was a large randomized trial from the United Kingdom called the recovery trial, which does demonstrate that when you give oral or intravenous dexamethasone to people who have oxygen deficits, that you do reduce mortality. But let me tell you something that should cause everyone to press the pause button on this budesonide idea. When they gave, they looked at the people in the recovery trial who got dexamethasone who didn't have an oxygen requirement, their mortality rate actually increased. So there's a signal that suggests that if you give steroids, immunosuppressive medications, early in the course of disease, when you need your immune system to be fighting off the virus, you could possibly make things worse. And we won't know until it's studied. I absolutely think that in inhaled steroids need to be studied, and they need to be studied in a 
prospective, randomized, blinded fashion so that we can all learn whether they help and then how to use them safely and wisely. But I strongly encourage that people who are thinking about maybe getting some off-label use of budesonide or hoarding it, that you not do that because we really can't tell you that that's going to help you. And there's even a possibility that if you use these steroids too early or too much of them, that you could harm yourself and worsen your chances of surviving COVID-19. Dr. Ruth, I want to ask you really quickly about workplaces, and I'm asking you because we get so many questions yeah. into KSAT about, similar to the one that I'm about to ask you, this one comes from John Doe, and he says, I know my company isn't the only one that behaves this way, but every time an employee is exposed to a positive COVID individual or test positive, they're told to keep quiet, go home, come back in two weeks. Is that ethical? Well, so we have contact tracing set up in the city, and we have our Metropolitan Health Authority that has trained up uh, extra and additional contact tracers. It is their job, in fact, when someone tests positive to call that person who's positive, and then Metro Health learns from that person who that person has been around. And then the contact tracers have to notify the folks that have been exposed so that those people can quarantine themselves and make a decision about whether it makes sense for them to get tested. So it's really not the medical or legal or health authority responsibility of the workplace to disclose the identity of the person who is sick, but it is their responsibility to disclose that within a work area, someone has had COVID-19. And there are protocols that should be followed. So if somebody has been working in a work area where there are multiple other people, and, and it is now known that that person has tested positive, they do need to close that work area down for at least 24 hours, and then they need to get a cleanup crew to come in and use approved viricidal agents to clean up all of the surfaces, wipe them down and use them properly. And then once all the surfaces have been cleaned, including the bathrooms and the doorknobs and all the places that the sick person has been in, um, then after that, workers can come back to work. and. Everybody needs to, I think, remember what is an exposure. It's being within six feet of another person for greater than 15 minutes without your mask on. And if people are following our guidelines right now, people should, if you're, you're working around a group of folks, you all ought to be masked. You all ought to be seated or positioned so that you're at least six feet apart. You shouldn't be going on breaks together and taking your masks off. And that's how you reduce your risk and prevent that kind of exposure. All right, before I let you go, I know you don't like to, you know, toot your own horn, but I'm going to do it for you. There was an outbreak at the jail earlier this year, and that was a big concern. And Judge Nelson Wolf talked about that outbreak and where we are right now at the county jail. So listen to this, doctor. This is, this is County Judge Nelson Wolf earlier this week. They've really done a good job. Dr. Ruth Bergman has been our guiding light in how we run the jail uh, from her advice, and she works with Metro Health. Uh, we're, we're, we're in good shape there now. Right. Yeah, but, so that is County Judge Nelson Wolf giving you some props there. Well, he should give props to the entire team. Uh, it takes a village. And um, the, the team was very proactive and very concerned. And, and I want everybody in San Antonio to feel proud of our officials at the county level and the folks who are diligently working hard in the jail to keep our whole community safe and also uh, respecting the health of, of the inmates. Here's another encouraging thing from that jail story that everybody ought to know about. We, we are able to prevent infection inside of a jail, the very place that you might think would be a disastrous place to get infection. And how do we prevent these infections inside a jail with masks and distancing and hygiene? And if it can work in a jail, it can work in your home and it can work in your workplace and it work in our city and it can help us flatten our curve back down. Well, I just want to echo what the county judge said and how much we appreciate you coming on with us and giving us the information and separating the fact from the fiction out there. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, UT Health San Antonio. Thank you, doctor. Do it. We'll Thank be right you. back.
Tomorrow is the last day for early voting in the primary runoff elections. New early vote totals show more than 42,000 ballots cast so far. That's more than 18,000 Republicans and more than 24,000 Democrats. A reminder, the Bear County Elections Office has contactless voting procedures for voters at the poll. You'll be provided with gloves or a pencil so you won't have to touch anything on your voting screen. Tomorrow is the last day to cast your ballot early, or you can visit the polls on Election Day, which is July 14th. You can find polling information and take a look at sample ballots right now on our website. Just go to ksac.com slash vote 2020. And a lot of people that I've talked to who've gone out and voted early said it's been a great experience. A great that's experience. What I'm hearing too. Easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Felt secure. So that's all great. All right, 87 degrees out there, Katie, and it is a warm one. Yes, the heat is here. We find ourselves now in a very hot and dry spell here in South Texas, and it doesn't look like that will be changing anytime soon. And we'll talk about the triple digit heat that is settling in coming in and just uh, coming up in just a few minutes. Excuse me. I do want to check on what's going on in the tropics. Here's a overview of what's going on in the Atlantic Basin. No disturbances that the Hurricane Center is watching, but we did have our latest tropical storm develop this evening. This is Tropical Storm Fay, very close to the east coast of the United States. Fay formed this afternoon just off the coast of North Carolina. Maximum sustained winds now are at 45 miles per hour, gusts up to 60. Movement is north at 8 miles per hour. Tropical storm warnings posted along New Jersey, the New York coastline, the Massachusetts coastline as well. So it will be the northeastern portion of the U.S. that will feel effects from Faye as we get into tomorrow and the early part of Saturday. Here is the forecast cone over the next three days. No more strengthening is expected, so Faye is expected to hold its tropical storm status before affecting parts of New England. As we get into tomorrow night, this is Friday at 8 p.m. and then weakening into a remnant low sometime on Saturday, but several inches of rain possible across portions of New England and maybe even some tropical storm force winds as well. Something very interesting to note about Faye. This is the earliest that an F named storm or the sixth named storm of the season has ever developed in the Atlantic Basin earliest that that has happened. So a little history made this afternoon as tropical storm Fay developed closer to home in the Gulf of Mexico and here in South Texas. We're just looking at a lot of heat here. High temperatures today, 99 in San Antonio. 106 the high temperature out in Del Rio, 102 in Carrizo Springs, upper 90s in the Hill Country. Our average high temperature this time of year for San Antonio is 94, and that's going to help to provide some perspective as we get into the next few days. As we get air temperatures closer to 103, 105. Yeah, that's trending a good bit above average for this time of year. Elsewhere across the country, still a lot of heat. That bright pink color indicating temperatures in the triple digits up in the Texas Panhandle. Phoenix 110 this afternoon, 106 in Las Vegas and still plenty toasty uh, along the East Coast as well. 94 the high in Cleveland, 91 in Washington, D.C. this afternoon. A little bit of rain moving through portions of the Great Lakes there and you can see Tropical Storm Fay just off to the east of Virginia and North Carolina there. Elsewhere, aside from a few little clusters of some severe storms up through the central portion of the plains, uh, things are pretty quiet. That includes here in Texas. I've got the upper level winds in the atmosphere here for you. You know what's centered just off to our west. It is the heat high and it will be keeping things hot and dry for us. Even as we get into next week, our July heat wave uh, is in full swing. So we'll see our air temperatures climb to 101 tomorrow, and then we get into some record territory as we get into the late weekend and early next week. What I think will help us out a little bit, though, in kind of the bright spot in the forecast, if you really, really want to find one, I may be stretching a little bit here, is that our dew point numbers, this bottom number here, those numbers in the afternoons, as our air temperatures shoot up to near 105, those dew point numbers will drop off a bit, and that's going to help the heat index from getting too out of control. So that's a little bit of good news, and we could even see some drier air start to mix in tomorrow. However, I really don't think that will kick in until Sunday and into early next week. So for tonight, we'll see few more low clouds roll in, so mostly to partly cloudy tomorrow morning, starting off near 80 degrees and then another hot afternoon under mostly sunny skies. These are your air temperatures, but just keep in mind the heat index essentially could be anywhere from 105 to 110 tomorrow afternoon, especially down to the south and off to the southwest in the afternoon hour. So again, pushing record highs as we get into the early part of next week. For now, the heat high shows no signs of moving away, but I promise when it looks like it might, we will be the first to let you know.
guys. So with the dew points yeah. kind of lower, it's a kind of dry heat. Yes. <laughs> kind dry, of a dry heat. Dryish heat. Dryish heat. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Thank you, Katie. They're still ahead on the night beat a change in guidance when it comes to the vaccine for the human papilloma virus, the new age range that doctors say children should be getting the vaccine. In your health headlines tonight, the American Cancer Society changing its recommendation when it comes to the vaccine for the human papilloma virus or HPV. Currently, that vaccine is recommended for boys and girls starting at age 11 or 12. But now experts say children should actually start receiving that vaccination at age 9 or 10. The human papilloma virus is so common. Almost every man and woman will contract some type of HPV at least once in their lives according to the Centers for Disease Control. And HPV can lead to several types of cancers in both men and women. That's why vaccinations have been recommended. The American Cancer Society says men who are up to age 26 should also get a catch-up vaccine. We'll be right back. We'll start the day tomorrow near 80, back in the triple digits tomorrow afternoon, and very hot stretch of weather settling in. Luckily, this weekend, that's when that dryish heat will kick in in the afternoon. That's some good news, but unfortunately, high pressure keeping us rain-free, so stage one water restrictions kick in tomorrow for SAWS customers. A lot more information about that can be found on ksat.com right now. Steve, ECs. Thank you, Katie. That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.